I understand that I'm kind of trying to do the impossible here. Drew asked if I would take this service two days ago, I guess. And I, or, and I thought, Chantel hadn't printed things yet, but I thought I'll work with what Drew had as the scripture. So the flexibility to say, I'm going to do this, or I'm, no, that doesn't work. So I'm asking for your patience and grace, and if not, it doesn't matter, I'm going to do it anyway. So that's what we've got this morning. And I would like to introduce you to a man, and we'll be reading from Luke 19, the first 10 verses. And they are on the screen. We'll get there in a second. Luke 19. And I, in this section, while you get there, we'll be introducing you to Zacchaeus. And I'm going to do it with pieces of what I would assume would be an unexpected poem in church to maybe help you understand some of the people's attitudes toward Zacchaeus. See if anyone knows this poem. Some of you may be old enough. Let me tell you how it will be. There's one for you, 19 for me. Should 5% appear too small, be thankful. I don't take it all. If you try to sit, I'll take your seat. If you get too cold, I'll tax the heat. If you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. And don't ask me what I want it for if you don't want to pay some more. And the punchline is, because I'm the tax man. That's a Beatles song. And if those kind of words frustrate the, daily, the daylights out of you, yeah, that's exactly how it goes. Well, one thing, be thankful Terry's in the assembly. Um, and we'll hear more about that tonight, correct, Terry? Well, not, 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 no, that, not in the bad sense. But that might, those words from a Beatles song might help you understand some of the attitudes towards the major supporting actor in today's reading, and that would be Zacchaeus, and I say supporting because the main actor, of course, is going to be Jesus. So, with that in mind, let's go to that piece of scripture. I will get there. Luke 10, Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down Immediately, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. As we go through this section of text... This does not work as a three-point message. I'm sorry, it just, I couldn't make it work. I'm going to open with some background about Jericho because I do think it matters to understanding this text. Um, then we'll look at what Je Zacchaeus sees and seeks in Jesus. And then we'll see, of course, the crux of the matter that Jesus seeks and sees Zacchaeus. And then we'll look at the responses to Jesus and, and Zacchaeus as they interact. And hopefully in there somewhere you'll see yourself wondering how are we to respond to these events. So introduction. The text tells us that Jesus entered 
Jericho. And uh, I would like to get a bigger picture of that. Jericho was situated in a crucial location. It's not exactly, according to the books I read, the spot of the Jericho and, and the walls. Near there, but not there. It was located in the Jordan River Valley, some distance north of the Dead Sea. And for our story, one important factor was that it was about 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. That would be Jesus' destination. It was surrounded by hills on both sides, uh, 3,500 feet on the one side, 4,000 on the other, a fairly steep claim, in and out. And it was a beautiful climate, however. Beautiful enough that the historian Josephus called it a little paradise. I had never known that. It was known for its balsam plantations, which produced an aromatic material revered for its medicinal qualities. It was also a winter capital of Roman royalty, which added to its wealth and status. Interestingly, at least for history geeks, Roman leader Mark Anthony gave the rights to the prophets from the sale of balsam to Cleopatra, I would guess to impress her. Tying this to the Bible, she sold them to Herod. Nice thing to do with a gift from a man, sell it. King Herod had a hippodrome there and a palace, and even the name Jericho might have had the meaning of perfumed tied to the actual meaning of the name. On the other hand, Jericho was also a busy trading center. It was on the secondary Roman north-south trade route that scrambled through the Jordan Valley. It was also a rare east-west trade route from Jerusalem. The east-west routes were difficult to find. Jewish priests had a station there. Pilgrims wandered through. Traders came from Damascus up in the north and Arabia down in the south. There were many royal attendants there. And because of all the money and goods traded there, uh, many publicans or tax collectors were there, as well as other forms of robbery. And since Zacchaeus was a chief collector, collector, one can only speculate just how wealthy he actually was. He sat atop the pile of the other great Ponzi scheme of tax collecting. Into that setting came Jesus. Where had he been? One source I looked at divided the book of Luke into several chunks which helped me see the life of Jesus at a glance. Chapters 1 through 8 give us Jesus' arrival and early life. Chapters 9 through 18 through which Drew has been lately bringing us as a congregation show the bulk of Jesus' earthly ministry and instruction, and this would be mostly in the north of the country, toward and around the Sea of Galilee. Chapters 19 to the end show the culminating work of Jesus as the sacrificial lamb, risen Lord, and ascended king. Having completed his ministry and teaching in the north, he was now heading to Jerusalem for Passover, for his own sacrifice. There is, if we know the story, of course, building tension. Jesus knows, as those of us raised with the Bible also know, what was coming down the pike. Brief, misguided glory, betrayal, accusation, rejection, abuse, humiliation, pain, suffering, and death were Jesus' things to look forward to. Now, remembering back Sunday mornings, one or two weeks, chapters 17 and 18, Luke tells readers that Jesus had just encountered the rich young ruler. Remember that Jesus told him to give up all he had and follow him, and we are told that the rich young man became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And then, to quote one commentary, Jesus proceeded to boggle the minds of his dis disciples, declaring that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's one event that's recent. Continuing, Jesus arrives at Jericho and encounters a man who can't see, as later 
Zacchaeus' problem, for different reasons, also can't see. Blind Bartimaeus was yelling for Jesus to heal him, a not very dignified activity. Charles Spurgeon writes of this encounter that Jesus Christ had just blessed a blind man who was poor and so poor that he was a common wayside beggar. But looking ahead, Spurgeon asks, will he bless the rich man Zacchaeus too? Of course, he says, he know, Jesus knows no distinction of persons. He is ready to bless all classes, whether they be rich or poor is nothing to Jesus. So this is what is up as far as Jesus passing through Jericho. Finally, we get to meet Zacchaeus, the publicani or tax collector. To summarize what is taught to Sunday school children the world over, or at least it used to be, the tax collector was especially hated by the Jews. Zacchaeus was Jewish, yet he worked for the despised pagan government. His job entailed collecting taxes, hardly a popular job in any century. But before he turned the required tax amounts over to the Romans, he was allowed to add his own amount to it, at his discretion, for his own purse. Another reason the Jews hated him. And he was the chief tax collector, sitting atop a pyramid of other tax collectors, another mark against him. So what he was doing was fraudulent, meaning false or deceiving, phony, misleading. Another commentator defined it this way. What Zacchaeus did was to put pressure on someone for personal gain. Harass, squeeze, shake down, blackmail or to secure something through intimidation. And Zacchaeus even confesses this later with his own lips. The most well-known of Zacchaeus' attributes was his height. Some commentarists say that he's probably around five feet. I have no idea, and considering my family's general stature, I'll risk no further comment on the height at this time. But as it's popular to point out in the story, Zacchaeus was just not short physically. He was short morally. He literally and figuratively didn't measure up. So whatever the background, the truth of the story of Zacchaeus is that he did all he could to get to see this visitor, Jesus. We know that much. And as a tax collector for the Romans, he probably was considered unclean. Barring him from contact with Jesus, had Jesus, for example, gone to the local synagogue to open the word. In fact, tax collectors were lumped with others, prostitutes, for example, as sinners. Many times in the Gospels, tax collectors are paired with the sinners. So this is the status of Zacchaeus, rich but rejected and discontent. He wanted to encounter Jesus, but couldn't. We can picture this little hated man trying to force his way through a hostile crowd, but being blocked at, at all points, sneered at, maybe spit on. One of the points grammar nerds like myself appreciate is that translators note that Zacchaeus seeking Jesus is in the imperfect. This indicates that it's not a past thing, or a one-time shot, it's ongoing. It's over and over and over. Zacchaeus really wanted this encounter to happen. But also notice that he didn't want to just see Jesus. I never clued into this until reading a sermon by Pastor Brian Bill. He emphasizes that the text doesn't say that Zacchaeus just wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to figure out what it was that made Jesus different from everyone else. He may not have understood fully what was going on in his heart, but Zacchaeus had a desperate need to get to the real Jesus. So his twofold solution was this. First, run like a little child. A horribly undignified thing for a mature, responsible adult. And his second one was equally as crazy. He decided to climb a tree. 
There's a lot to be said when you start researching this tree. People will tell you all about sycamores being brought in. They don't natively grow there. But a thousand years before, some people had brought sycamores, planted them, and those old trees now had side branches he could climb. Whatever, here's this guy sitting up there in a tree. And there is so much here metaphorically to say, but I'll let a Scottish theologian sum it up. I wish there were more of us who did not mind being laughed at as if only what we did helped us to see Jesus better. So now Zacchaeus has his view and hopes to figure out who this Jesus actually is. Now we move to Jesus seeing and seeking Zacchaeus. John Calvin wrote, Curiosity and simplicity are a sort of preparation for faith. And as important as it was that Zacchaeus was seeking to know who Jesus was, it's much more important that Jesus sought out Zacchaeus. To quote one source, we know from Scripture that no man seeks for God. That's from Romans. So, it was not, so if it was not out of curiosity, then it had to be because the Spirit had urged Zacchaeus to do so. Jesus taught that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's from John 6. And also, Jesus said, no man can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Or to quote John Stott, my faith is due to Jesus Christ himself, who pursued me relentlessly, even when I was running away with him in order to go my own way. And if it were not for the pursuit of the gracious pursuit of the hound of heaven, a poem some of you might know. I, today, John Stott says, would be on the scrap heap of wasted and discarded lives. Or finally, Spurgeon says, Christ did not have to leave it to ourselves to seek him, or else if it would be left indeed, for so vile is human nature that although heaven is be offered, and though hell thunder in our ears, yet there never was and there never will be any man who, unconstrained by sovereign grace, will run in the way of salvation and so escape hell and flee to heaven. Thus, if you are seeking God today, you know that it is only because of the Savior's kindness in taking that initiative to seek you first. What interests me most of that entire meeting, however, is what Jesus does next. He calls him by name. And it's, we have no reason to believe, we're not told, don't want to make too much out of this, but they're really, probably, as a human being, Jesus would never have known about Zacchaeus. I, I don't know why he would have. But Jesus walks up and calls him by name. Uh, and the name of Zacchaeus, ironically, means pure, innocent, or clean. There are many angles here, but these jump to mind. First, I thought of the song we often sing in church, He Knows My Name. Second, and maybe a bit embarrassingly, I thought of this one. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. Yeah, you want to be where everybody knows your name. And I won't yell, norm at this point. Even more striking, humanly speaking, is that Jesus knew his name. An InterVarsity uh, Bible handbook noted that Jews at the time of Jesus would have considered knowing the name of a person one had not met as a sign of a true prophet. In any event, this is Jesus. Saying his name made all the difference. Jesus told Zacchaeus, I know you, and I lay some claim upon you. And furthermore, Jesus knew the importance of a name. He said in John 10, he calls his sheep by name. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep, sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now here's the final outrageous thing that occurs. Jesus just doesn't say he'd like to maybe visit with Zacchaeus if he'd just come out of that tree for a minute. He states an imperative. I must, 
I don't know, I had never noticed that word, really, until reading this time. I must stay at your house today. This is a binding word. It's not an optional word. It's necessary. If Jesus was on a mission to seek and save the lost, he was making it clear that it had to happen, and it had to happen now. I would have paid to see Zacchaeus clamor out of that tree. How can you possibly climb out of a tree as an older guy with the dignity of a wealthy man? I don't know what to make of that, but it's, it had to be an incredible scene. Spurgeon says this sup- professedly superior teacher, this purist, this teacher of the highest morality had gone to be, requested to be, the guest of a tax gatherer, a disreputable person altogether. Ah, how does the legal spirit in self-righteous men cry out against the sweet benevolence of our blessed master who comes to the world for this very purpose, to be the guest of sinners, that he might be the physician of sinners. So there's your scene, there are the events. The actual event is sort of over for the moment, so now we get to the end. What are the responses? And we have several here. The people and the Pharisees responded with outrage, shock, their version of righteous indignation, and the people began to grumble. And if you go back to the Old Testament, the word you hear there might be something like murmur. They seem to be good at that. Um, In some ways... It's not really confronting. It's just standing back with a whole bunch of people complaining. And again, a translator notes that Luke uses the imperfect, that continual act, a continual state of affairs. Someone didn't just yell out a comment or an obscenity. There was a buzz in the crowd. All began to murmur and grumble. You can almost see the sneers on their faces. He has gone to be the guest of sinners. The Believer's Bible Commentary notes here that the people, the grumblers, overlooked the fact that coming into a world like ours, he was limited exclusively to the home of sinners. The physician heals the sick. Further, David Lowe's adds that this is not the first time bystanders have been outraged by Jesus' behavior. Think of Simon's reaction that Jesus would allow a woman all known to have a poor reputation to wash his feet with her tears. Or the reaction of the Pharisees to the sinners and tax collectors who love to listen to Jesus from John 15. Nor is this the first time tax collectors have figured prominently in Jesus' ministry. At the outset of the previous chapter, or going back another, it's the penitent tax collector, not the righteous Pharisee, who returns home justified. Another source, which I didn't include, talked a bit about the fact that Jesus encounters specifically mentioned tax collectors a number of times, maybe up to seven times. I forget the number. I didn't prove it. And in every time, unlike the Pharisees, who are called a brood of vipers, or a whitewashed tomb, the the tax collectors come out of the encounter in a somewhat positive light. Hmm. So how did Zacchaeus respond? Here we have our response thing. Well, first, gladly, joyfully, is how we're told he responded. It's the same word used to describe the magi when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So that's Zacchaeus. Secondly, not murmuring, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, and that stood up thing, based on the sources I looked at, means a little more than, you know, he's sitting in a recliner and got up. He stood there, or he stood his ground. Leon Morris says Zacchaeus stopped, sort of in the, he took up a stance, There is a note of formality about which fits the important announcement Zacchaeus was about to make. And apparently, Jesus and Zacchaeus had come to the house of Zacchaeus and were about to enter when the murmur became such a roar that Zacchaeus turned around and faced the crowd. Another scene I would like to witness. 
he proceeded to give striking evidence of what Jesus' visit had done for him. This is a vivid detail that's easy to miss. Zacchaeus hears the murmuring of the crowd and he stops on a dime, one source said, the way we, we might talk. He had a message that the grumbling audience needed to hear and this before they even settle into his house for the meal and the visit and the fun. Yes, the crowd had a right to grumble and so he senses a need to give a public testimony of his changed heart. This is a transaction that could not possibly be put off. What was this great transaction, this important deal, the radical announcement he had to make? Look, Lord, King James would say probably behold or something like that. Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I have cheated anybody out of anything I will pay back four times the amount. Wow. Zacchaeus begins with a confession of sin by calling himself a fraud and a cheat and he offered the fruit of repentance and a changed heart. This is in keeping with the teaching of John the Baptist who says in Luke 3, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children of Abraham. One commentary said, here we see Zacchaeus, the son of Abraham, physically bear fruits in keeping with repentance, demonstrating that as he, he is a son of Abraham spiritually. We need to follow the example of Zacchaeus. Faith alone in Christ alone saves. But the faith that is alone is suspect. In other words, the faith that demonstrates no faith is a dead faith. See the book of James for that confusing thought. Or to quote John Calvin, I didn't know Calvin got these cute little phrases like this. It is faith alone that justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Zacchaeus gave ample evidence of an inner change through an outward response. Brian Bill stated, Paul said, wherever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Zacchaeus went in, mastered by the passion to get. He came out, swept by a compassion that gives. The core of his personality changes to, I give, I restore. Not like the rich young ruler, I keep, I go. Stephen Cole rightly says, one of the surest tests of genuine repentance is when God gets a hold of our wallet. So to conclude, I guess this again is the hard part, the so what part. We've heard that Zacchaeus sought to know who Jesus was with all his might, only to find out it was Jesus seeking him. We've heard how the crowd and their leaders threw judgment and hatred on Zacchaeus and Jesus' way. That was their response. We've seen the response also of the unclean, fraudulent tax collector who repented and offered recompense. So that leaves us, the hearers of the word. If we are to be not hearers only, but doers of the word, what are we to do? I have a few suggestions, and then I'll wrap up. First, do we recognize that Jesus is the source of change in our lives, that he is the source of the power to do any good? Remember the rich young ruler. Jesus said, it's impossible with man for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's possible with God. This is a fulfillment of that promise. Just a short chapter later, Jesus became, Zacchaeus became a joyful giver, thus showing God's impossible work in him. But the young ruler went away sorry, vainly clutching his riches. Consider the source. Second, if you consider yourself unworthy of God's goodness and grace, this story is for you. And that really, of course, should be all of us. 
It reaffirms that by any standard, God can save anyone. Tax collectors were the lowest of the low morally and spiritually in that society. And they knew it, and they stayed their course. Stephen Cole notes that in light of the public hatred of tax collectors, it's significant that they do get mentioned in favorable light. In fact, Jesus picked one, Levi or Matthew, as one of his 12. This shows Jesus' heart for sinners and the transforming power of his saving grace. The love, mercy, and grace of God are not limited to the extent of our sinfulness or none of us would be saved. This message of God's love and salvation is for every human being. That's the power it has. Third, how are you and I as professed followers of Christ to demonstrate this saved condition? How are we causing gratitude for our salvation from sin to flow in an ever-growing stream? What are you willing to do to get a better view of Jesus? It's one of those strangely metaphorical things. Zacchaeus claimed to get a better view of Jesus. What are you willing to do to get a better view of Jesus? It sounds trite, but it's true. Any sincere effort to get closer to him will have a good result. God rewards people who earnestly seek him, it says in Hebrews 11. Here's a challenge from a pastor. The greater question is this. How do you, and I, show the reality of Christ in your life? The answer for you would be the same as it was for Zacchaeus. Here's the principle involved. The reality of your new life in Jesus Christ will be seen precisely at the moment of your old weakness. His problem was money, greed, and lust. Therefore, since that was the point of weakness, that's the point at which his new life was demonstrated. It wouldn't do any good for Zacchaeus to say, Lord, I'm not going to curse anymore, because we don't know that cursing was his problem. It wouldn't do to say, Lord, I'm going to be a nice guy, because being a jerk wasn't his problem, possibly. If you gossip and that's your weakness, if that doesn't change, then coming to church isn't going to make a difference at all. It's not simply that you add on something to your past weaknesses. Real conversion is shown when you change in the future what used to be your weak point. If bitterness is your problem, then that's the era, area that has to change. If treating people like dirt is your problem, then that's the area that has to change. The beauty of the whole process of sin, repentance, deliverance, and gratitude is that, of course, it's God-based. With him, all things are possible. The verse that we read before illustrates the experience of Zacchaeus. Jesus came to him, sought him, and saved him. The whole gospel is in a simple sentence. And if you go back and read, there aren't even two syllables in any of the words for Pete's sake. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Praise God for the saving work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.